and good morning everybody it's Claire here from Sewing by Claire and today we're going to carry on with our Christmas in July event although it's now August um, but we're going to go on to part two of the advent calendar that we're making from a fabric panel so hopefully you've got your pockets sorted if not you're just having a look watch along and just seeing how how the whole process is but um, yeah on this one we're going to actually prepare the main panel now um, in order to get that ready for taking the pockets when just a spoiler alert we're not actually going to attach the pockets today I'm going to save that to a later um, video because for me I think it's going to be easier if we embellish and um, get the fabric panel quilted without the pockets on because they're just going to get in the way really for now so for this this video we're going to be prepping the fabric panel now the main panel ready for taking the pockets and that the, the pockets will go on in part three so I hope you enjoy it so if you haven't already, pop along and have a look at part one in this video series, because in that we actually prepped these pockets in, as the first step in getting our um, advent calendar ready. Uh, and then these were popped to one side. So uh, just, just a quick note, if you haven't already watched it, please pop along to watch the first video and get these all ready. So originally what we've done is we cut off the bottom of our panel that enclosed our pockets that was onto the bottom of this part here that was printed and then we trimmed around this outside red border so you should just have one layer of your fabric panel that's like this what you'll see now is that i've actually layered mine and this is what's called a quilt sandwich for those who don't quilt and if I just turn it sideways, just so you'll be able to see. So we have our top layer of, of fabric on the top, and that's our panel, and we've got it the wrong right side up. We've then got a layer of what's called batting or wadding, depending on where in the world you live. Let me just bring this up to the camera to have a look. And it's a woven style of, um, this one's a wool one, I think, but you can also get cotton and you can also get synthetic. I tend to go for the natural fibres, but that's just because that's what I prefer. But um, there's nothing to say that any is any better than the other. It's just down to personal preference and what you want. Um, you can. There's lots of um, posts on the internet about wadding and which ones are best for the others. This is just a thin one because we don't need too much um, depth to the actual advent calendar itself. Um, but that is the, the next step that you'll do. And that has to be at least an inch wider on all four of your sides than your fabric panel okay and then what I've got on the back of mine is just a bit of plain cotton which is just a bit of curtain lining because what we're going to do and that then again I like to just be able to see the edge of that outside of my um, wadding as well so you've got the three layers there and we're going to be sewing through all three layers now when, when we work on this, this um, panel next. So we have our fabric panel, we have our wadding, and then we have the, the cotton on the back. The reason why we've put cotton on the back is that because if we just have the wadding and the fabric panel, we need to have the fabric panel up so we can see where we're sewing, but the, the loops and the fibres on the wadding tend to get caught on your feed dogs. Um, underneath the machine and so that's not really very good for your machine so that's why I've just used this inexpensive um, sheet of a um, little bit of um, fabric it might even be a poly cotton it, it doesn't matter it's not going to go against anybody's skin or anything so it doesn't matter about that now when I finish this quilt off my plan is to actually put a, another backing on the back of this um, and that might seem extravagant and obviously it's up to you as to what you think you want to do best the reason for that for me is because when we go through all three of these um layers in order to embellish this this part and and, and the pocket and so the pockets on on the back here because the fabric here is going to be on black um, and a lot of the outlining is done on black on the characters i don't want you to see little white bobbles where the um thread of the bobbin comes up slightly because even if you get your tension absolutely perfectly sometimes it does so i don't want that to happen on mine which means i'm going to use black um, thread or dark thread for most of this, I think, in both my bobbin and also on my reel of cotton on, on my machine. So when I sew, you're going to see all the outline on the back here. Now, that might not be a problem to you, and if, if, you, if your budget's tight and you can't stretch to another backing, don't worry about it. It's fine, because you're only ever really going to see the front of the, of the panel when this is hung up 
and being displayed so in actual fact it isn't i know it's an extravagance and if you don't want to do that you don't have to but that's why i'm not going to worry about going all the way through and having this on a, on a white fabric or you could choose to have a dark fabric that then um backing that matches the thread color you're going to be doing most of your quilting in in which case then you're not going to see it anyway so again it's just up to you as to what you want to do but for me i'm going to actually have this white one on and then when i finish it off i'm going to have um the a, a coordinating one that's going to match really a bit more with with the panel um for the backing and mine and then i'm hoping to put a quilt label on the back of it as well just to say when i stitched it and obviously who it's for so what i want you to do is once you've got this you'll see me keep smoothing this down and what that does it just helps just the fibers just start to knit together into the between the cotton and the wool and the lining and it doesn't it doesn't kind of hold it enough to pin it but if i lift this edge you can see this bit here's lifting up as well and that's kind of what you want you want it to be treated as one really from going forwards once we've got to this stage here there's a couple of things that we can do because now we need to fix these two layers together so three layers together in order that we can sew on them now i use because i'm a quilter i've got lots of safety pins these are quite inexpensive to have just a, about an inch long i think these are let me have a look and see for you yeah these are just an inch long and they've got a slight curve i don't know if you can see that on the camera this bottom edge slightly curves because one thing that you're trying to do is put put the um the pin in and you want it to kind of naturally come up to meet you when you're putting it through so what I'm going to do then is I'm going to start in the middle of my quilt and I'm going to put a pin in that just takes a bite through of all three areas, all three layers, areas, layers. So I can just see that coming through on the back there. And the idea is that you work out from there, keep smoothing your fabric down, make sure you've got, and you want to try and have no creases on the back of this at all. If it needs an iron, give it an iron, a press. And then I'm just going to start and build up my um, pins, safety pins. Now I'm keeping away from where I want to sew. Now I know I want to sew along the top of these pockets here. The pockets aren't on yet, but these blocks where the pockets are going to sit over the top of, because I've got, um, I don't, I want, get your words right, Claire. Okay, because what I want to do is I want to fix the top of those pockets down. Um, where are my pockets going? Let me show you. So if I get the one that is starts number 11, which is this one. So this is our pocket. And our pocket will eventually sit on here, on top. And we will sew it down the sides here and across the bottom and then back up the other side. But we won't actually sew along this top edge because we want to be able to get into the pocket from the top. So what I'm going to do, my first, one of my first rows, because that's halfway along, is I'm going to run a row of stitching in black just along that fixed edge just there. I'm going to do that with all four of these pockets. So all that to say, what I'm doing is when I'm pinning, I'm making sure I'm not on the line that I actually want to stitch because otherwise you're going to be having to undo these all the way through. And it is just easier if you can keep them in for the time being and then sort them through. So that's the first bit that we've got done which is just popping those across there. Now, if you've not got safety pins to hand, the other thing you can do is um, just put some, some thread, a, um, a contrast colour thread in your needle, and you can just do a running stitch, a large one, all the way across there, and, it'll, and then in between each of these, and it will just start to hold those three layers together. And then once we've sewn, we'll just pull those threads out. Again, you can choose what you want to do. I've, I've done both before, and actually, by the time you finish pinning, you, you you could have sewn it you could have firm tacked it so again it just depends on what you want to do so now that we've gone north to south or well the way i've got the orientation of this this panel at the moment i'm now going to go across and just do it into the sections so we're just quartering it really with by putting the pins in and when these pins come out they'll make a little hole originally but then they should come out if you just run your finger over the fibers it should just close up that hole for you let me just carry on with this. Okay, I'm looking a little bit dark. Let me just get some more light on. Hold on one second. Okay, hopefully that's a little bit better. So all I'm doing now is just quartering through these pocket, these um, this panel with my safety pins. 
you can see sometimes you, they can be a little bit fiddly. So I'm just um, putting pins in the centre of these pocket panels just here. So there's no pockets on this yet because we're going to do the actual quilting first and the embellishing. Now, if you do want to embellish your pockets as well, because obviously there's characters on here. So if you wanted to say, put some a sequin on here or a little bit of ribbon or a bow or what have you, now's the time to embellish your pockets. Or if you wanted to embroider over the, the numbers, then you can do any of that that you wanted to. So, so just bear that in mind that if you want to, to, to embellish those, now's the time to do it before you actually fix it onto your panel. So you're trying to again, just smooth out your panel so that you get no creases in it on the top or underneath so everything's lying really flat and then we just work out from there and they normally say about a fist width apart so that's what you're wanting to do for these panels and, and on your wadding as well it will tell you how far apart you should quilt it so that's is granted more for quilts that are going to be um, that are larger and that are going to be washed perhaps in the future but it's always worth just having a little look at that and seeing what is needed on the product that you're buying so let me just carry on pinning and then i'll come back to you So I'm just putting some um, pins as well down towards the sides, towards the edges, because what we're going to do is we are going to actually outline the whole panel as well, but we won't do that until the last. We'll, we start off in the centre of the quilt and we do the lines that we can first, um, because that way then, if there are any creases, we, we can smooth those out before we get to the edges. And the idea is that you're kind of moving your creases out to the edges all the time. And you'll be surprised at how much firmer this will all become as it gets quilted as well because the, the, the process of actually attaching the three layers together gives the fabric a stiffness, which is really quite, is quite nice. It's quite tactile as well. So there we go. So I've got pins along this edge here and then pins in here across the top there and then along in, in these pockets here. I'm just gonna just have a quick look. Let's hope we've got not got any creases. No, everything's all staying, staying flat. If when you run your hands across, like in this bottom corner, I'm getting a little bit of a crease. Let's turn it around for you here. So as I run my fingers out onto here, I can see I'm getting a little bit of a crease on this one. So I'm going to take that one out and just um, tighten that one up. And again, just there. So let's just, it's worth just getting this right, folks. I mean, it depends. It, it is worth getting it right. It, um, it depends if you're actually going to see it um, and if it's your final backing or not. Because ideally, if you were going into competitions with quilts and what have you, then you shouldn't have any creases on your back of your quilt at all. Let's just, let's just move slightly. Let's just move this. So yeah, so I'm just going to just go through and just tighten these up a little bit now that we've got them pretty much in. Most of them are fine. So it's just the odd one or two that just feels like it just needs a little bit of tightening. And then we're going to move over to the sewing machine and I'm going to talk to you about having a walking foot for doing the quilting and for doing this. And also we're going to do some quilting by hand. So it's going to be a mixture of hand and um, machine quilted. So I'm going to show you both techniques. And then once we've done that, we can talk about how we can embellish it as well, whether we want to put on a few little sequins, a few little beads, a little bit of ribbon maybe. Um, perhaps on the bows, we could do a bit of a ribbon over the top of the ones that we've got. Um, so again, this is where it's actually... Oh, let me just turn you around a second. This is where it's actually going to be up to you as to how much you want to embellish and how much you don't, because 
there's so much you could do to it, but, but you could go crazy if you wanted to. And if you've got time and you've got the um, artistic ability to do that, then, then please go ahead and, and actually make it yours. Make it as, as complicated and as detailed as you want. But for me, I want it to, I'm probably doing going to a medium amount. So I want to do a little bit extra than we might have done because I love the way that the animals will pop when we quilt it. And I'll show you how we do that. Um, and I want to add a few sequins and a few little buttons because I think that does just add to the to add to the panel. But again, you'll see those ideas and decide what you want to do. And then you can choose whether you get carried away or whether you just do the bare minimum. It depends how much you enjoy the process. So let me just get um, over to my walking foot and I'll talk to you about that. So when we're quilting, we tend to use something called a walking foot. And this is what a walking foot, excuse my initials on it. It was just in case I, I um, took it to a class with me and lost it. Um, so a walking foot is this kind of is this kind of thing. It's got quite a big bulky back to it. It's got a lever here that moves up and down. And if you can see, as we're moving the lever, this bit here on it is moving as well. And underneath there are some little serrated edges on the edges of here. Okay. So what happens is when you've got your ordinary presser foot, as you're sewing along on your fabric, if there's any looseness in the fabric, then it, the, the pressure of the presser foot on it can sometimes cause fabric to ripple up in front of it, in front of this bit here, and create some pressure. And because we're working with three layers all together, we want those three layers to, to be pulled through underneath the needle equally so that there's not, the, the top level doesn't shift against one of the bottom levels as we're moving. So that's where a walking foot comes in. Now, a walking foot isn't just used for um, quilting. Um, I use it for dressmaking as well if I'm working on slippery fabric. So like this cashmere at Upton that I made, this was slippery and I'd got a, an interlining as well with it, which was a silk organza. So there's a chance that those could have moved. So again, I used my walking foot for that. And also you'll find it great for on stretch fabrics if ever you're sewing anything in stretch fabrics or if you're a bag maker and you're um, trying to manage all of those layers perhaps just top stitching around the top edge of a bag again a walking foot is going to be absolutely invaluable to you they aren't cheap though this one was 50 pounds um so it's they're, they're they're an investment in your sewing um but i think that you'll find that they're really useful i i, I was talking to somebody and recently um hello to julie if you're watching um and we were talking about um sewing and and, and working with stretch fabrics natural fat um and julia got a a foot that she uses was came as a machine and part of a quilting package but she'd only ever thought of it as being for quilting so I'm going to ask you, to, if you have got one, to look it out. If you've not got one, you might want to add it onto your Christmas list. They really are helpful. There's two kinds, though, and I, I messed up when I bought mine a little bit because it, this is called a closed toe foot where you've got this metal bar across here. You can see the slit for the, um, for the needle to go in and out, but then actually down here, that, that holds the fabric flat, so there's only this amount of movement of your fabric when you're, when you're sewing over it. I ordered an open toe foot. So in actual fact, when I'm trying to use this to sew some some fabrics, it doesn't, it would be great for a plique because it would obviously, well, they wouldn't really use it for a plique, but for example, if you've got something like that where you needed to see where you were going a little bit more, that would be easy. I mean, I tend to line my reference points up with there or on the edge of the feet here, just the, where the clear plastic meets the metal. But on here, it, I wish now I'd bought a closed toe one. So just be aware, have a think about what you want to use it for and whether you want a closed toe walking foot or your an open toe one, because that'll be on my Christmas list, I think, for, for next time is to have a, an open, a, a closed toe one as well. Because I sometimes find that if I'm trying to fabric, sometimes the needle gets caught, the fabric gets caught on the needle and gets pulled up a little bit. And that's not what I want. But I wouldn't be without it don't get me wrong i'm not i'm not i'm 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 not being disrespectful to my walking foot um they're really useful to have so so just be aware of how that can work because if you're going to try and do this with the three layers and use your ordinary presser foot you might find you get that bunching underneath or just that rippling underneath your presser foot and if you do you can try loosening off the pressure because there is a way of loosening the pressure off on your foot um but you'll need to You'll, you'll need to look to your um, user manual for that for your particular make and model. Also, if you can afford it, 
I'd strongly recommend that you go for the named brand walking foot. I did buy a cheaper one thing and it was only about 12, 12 pounds I think, but it, it didn't work. And, and I actually ended up having to buy, go ahead and buy the, the um, Janome one just literally a month or two later so it was a it was a false economy is what i'm saying but again you, you might have one with your machine it, it's telltale is this this big bit on the back here it's got a slit in it as well and that's actually because if you want to quilt in straight lines you can you have something like this called a quilting guide that sometimes comes with them and what you do is you slot that into the back there and you run that along a line or a previous stitch line as you're sewing and you can then use that to do your spacing because that doesn't move very easily. It does move sometimes, just keep measuring it if you're doing a few rows. But if you're doing something like called match stitch quilting, which is just straight lines on a quilt, or you're going diagonally, you can sometimes follow a previous line with that. So that's quite helpful to have. The other thing to bear in mind with the walking foot, put those away, is how you attach it. Now this little lever here has to go above your the screw that tightens up your needle into the presser foot. Let me move you down to my machine and I'll show you what I mean. So when you're going to attach this, um, if you use your hand crank, you can see the needle going up and down. And this bit here is a bar that tightens up your needle. You unscrew that and your needle will drop out. And what you need to do is you need to attach this so that that bar here, the one that moves up and down, is over the top of your needle bar. So I always do that bit first, before then, I've got my needle down, so hold on a second. And then I then slide it onto the edge then. Let me just do that again for you, so you can see. So what I do is I lift the bar up, put it over the top of my needle um, bar, and then I attach it onto the edge of my presser foot, and you'll need your screwdriver to screw that in. And screw it nice and tight. Oops, I'm trying to do it left-handed. Oh, no, I'm not trying to do it right-handed, but a bit messed up. Hold on one second. So that will tighten up really nice and tight. So nice and tight. And then as you can see, when you put your needle bar down, needle, your hand crank, your, your, oh, your needle down, the bar goes down too, and then it goes back up again. Okay, and it moves these press at these feed dogs that then slot in, into the ones underneath. So you've got this dual action where the fabric is being pulled under um, by both sets of feed dogs. And that's what gives you that nice even feed on the slippery fabrics, on stretch fabrics, and on multi-layer fabrics like this, this quilting program and this project. So that's what we're going to do next. So let's, I'll take you back out again and we'll have a look at doing the, um, doing the quilting. So the first line that I'm going to do by machine is I am going to do this first line at the top of the pockets because that's as far as I can get into being equal halfway across. You could start at the middle and work out both ways and I'm sure that some people may want to do that. If you're a seasoned quilter, that's what you may want to do. Just roll up your project so that it'll fit inside your um, machine throat, as they call it. And I've lost my threads underneath. Let me just find my other thread because I want to be able to hold onto those. Where's it gone? There it is. Okay, so I've got my both threads long enough to hold at the back. Okay. And I'm gonna start right on this very corner. So what I'm gonna do is before I put my, put my presser foot down, is I'm just gonna maneuver that so that the needle pierces straight in on that corner. And then I can use my needle down to secure it. And then I can put my presser foot down. What I'm hoping is that these pins stay out of the way while we're sewing. And I'm going to turn my um, stitch length up to a num to up to three. And I'm going to hold on to my threads and I'm just going to start sewing along that black line, taking my time. This is not a time for speeding. I'm just going to just go backwards just to secure those stitches. So nice and slowly, folks. And you're just trying to hold on to, keep as straight as you can on top of the straight line that goes along the top of the pockets. It's in black, so we've got a little bit of room for manoeuvre. And hopefully you can see that there's no stress being caused at the, in the front of the walking foot. Just try and stay on the line if you can. 
take a breather if you need to just to reposition yourself make sure everything's all nice and smooth Hopefully you're making a little bit of an heirloom project, aren't you? So it's worth taking your time because this is going to be used for many years. And actually, if it's beautifully made and loved, then it could be passed down from children to grandchildren eventually. I'm just getting to the end here. A couple more stitches and I'm just going to reverse just to secure that. Okay. So let's take that out and cut through our threads. So on the back here, we've got a nice, neat line of stitching that started to hold those three layers together. No creases in the fat back. If you do, and you're going to back it up again, it doesn't matter so much, but ideally you'd have no creases because that you can sometimes feel those through. And then on the front side, we can see, we just start to get a little bit of an indentation. Um, and that's what's going to give us that quilted effect when we're finished, it's, it's really quite nice. So let's just tighten up my threads on the other end while we're going because it, can be a bit tedious at the end to be taking all of the threads off those in the bin and then what I'm going to do now is just smooth it along hold on to my threads out the back here and then we're going to do the second top of the pocket next so I'm going to start just here again so again I'm just going to roll my fabric over that's under the throat of my machine to make sure that's out of the way I'm going to offer my needle up first to where I want it to be then use my needle down button just to secure that in. Now I've got a pin just at the back there that's just might, oh, it's, it might just be okay. So holding on to our threads again, couple of stitches forward, couple of stitches back just to hold those threads in place and then we're off again. And we're just going to be doing the top of this pocket here. As close to that black line on the top as we can. I've got black thread in my machine bobbin and the top reel. Oops. I've just gone off a little bit with that. Am I happy with that or not? I'll have a look at that. I'm going to carry on. I can always just redo that bit if I need to. So again, just taking our time. I'm trying to get right on top of the black line. It's good for testing your accuracy, this is. I don't suggest you do it on camera while you're trying to do that. But what I will do is I can show you how to correct it because I think I will redo that red pocket again. As I say, this is hopefully going to be around for a long time, so I want it to be I want it to be perfect, don't we, if we can. Without giving ourselves a headache and stress. to follow if I had got my uh, closed toe foot on. You have more reference points to mark, so let's just get that off. Now I'm not doing the bottom or the sides of the pockets because when we sew the pockets on that will automatically be um, secured down. So I think you're getting the gist of what we're doing with this but what I'm just going to show you now is that I'm going to redo the top of this red pocket because I'm not happy with it. So let me just find my quick unpick. This is just a general tip as well. So I'm just going to unpick because it's that bit there and that bit there that I'm not happy with. So I go to where the, the middle of the stitching is that I want to unpick. I just start it off. And what I'm going to do is mark that position on the back because it's if I, if I damage any threads, I want the threads to be damaged on the back of the project, not on the front. So always try and unpick from the other side if you can. We'll just, un again, this, these stitches being three, three, um, size three on here are better, aren't they, as well. Let's just take some of these out. I want to go to about here. So what I'm trying to do is give myself a nice long um, thread so I'm not 
ripping it off because I want to use those threads to be able to bury into the project. So let's just go past where we wanted to undo. Oh, and there it's not worked for me. Look, my quick on pick's too sharp. Okay, so let me just check on the front. Right, so I've gone past where I want to be. What I'm going to do then is I'm going to pull on this thread here. Oh, I'm just off screen, aren't I? Sorry. So what I'm going to do then is I've unpicked to the point at which I was happy to, um, with the stitching. And then if I pull on that thread, it gives me a little loop, if you can see that. And then if you pull through on the little loop, you can then knot it off if you wanted to. If I, if I was working, because I know we're going to back this one again, so I'm not, I'm not going to worry about this having the, the threads on the back. And I usually do three knots. And then with my snips, I'm just going to snip that off. The other way that I do it, if you were, if you're not using a separate back, backing on here, is I would un, unpick again. Try and keep yourself a nice long um, piece of thread if you can. Okay, and I'm past where I want to be. Again, I'm going to pull on the top thread, and that gives me a little loop here that I can put my quick unpick through, and then gently just pull that through. What I'm going to do then is get a needle. So again, you can knot this off now. I'll probably only just do two knots though this time. Because what I'm going to do with this, I'm going to bury these threads into my um, quilt. So if you snip off the end to give you a nice straight edge, it doesn't matter, it's a nice big needle, so it doesn't matter too much because we're just using it as a tool. And then what I want you to do is just then thread by the knot, just pull your thread in. Try and feel so you don't go through onto the front of your, of your quilt. Um, of your project but you're going between the, the different um, layers and in through the batting and then you can then pull those threads through like that leave a tail and if you put a little bit of pressure on the tails when you snip they get pulled through back into the center of your quilt so you won't actually see those then as a, as a problem on there and what I'm going to do now is join this the stitching back up again on the top and then redo that line Hopefully a bit neater than I did it the first time. So let's bring my machine forward again. Take my threads through to the back. I think it's always worth knowing how to put things right because it's not that we don't ever go wrong. It's, don't, it's not that I don't ever go wrong. It's that we just know how we can put it back again to make it right. So let me just pull that thread at the back. Where's my other one gone? There it is, right. Let me hold on to those. Bunch my quilt up so it's nice and flat in between because again, we're, we're meeting up with this other one so we don't want any lines and um, creases moving. So I'm gonna go forward and back while I'm on the black as well, it does help. Okay, and now let's try again and see if I can get it a little bit neater than I did before. That's better already. Just trying to follow that line, one stitch at a time, nice and steady. Just need a rest while I just re-jig. Re and we're just trying to make sure, if you run your finger, you should be able to see. If there's going to be a bunching up, you know that you've, you've got some tension on the top fabric. But here, I haven't at all, it's just going to go smooth. So hopefully, it should just run smoothly into it. smoothly into where I finished off my last stitches. So I'm just going to reverse back. And that should be enough now. So if I just take that off there, leave myself a little bit to finish off with. And there we go, I'm happy with that. But again, hopefully you can start to see the quilting effect starting to take shape. So we, we, we did a, a back stitch on here, so I can just take these straight off. Thread on the back as well as we're going along. Okay, so if you want to carry on with that and do the um, the other two pockets, um, I've done two, and then we're going to do the other two, and then I'll show you what I'm going to do next. Now, just a quick tip I've just thought of whilst you're um, sewing is that sometimes when you've got the fabric and you've got it across all of your your, your um, the base plate of your sewing machine, it can be difficult to get enough friction through from your hands to push it through. 
You can buy quilting gloves that have little um, rubber dots on the bottom and they give a bit of grip and they really do help. But the other thing that I found is these, um, these bath mitts really. And what they are, they're the ones that you use for exfoliating. But I found that they're just the fibres on them do just give you enough of a hold. So I'm going to put my, my bath mitts on. I think those are only a pound a pair, I think, from some of the body shops as well, or the pound shop. So it's not a lot of not a money to buy. But the difference between actually being able to handle your quilt as you're sewing is quite is quite important. Or oh, not quite important, is it? It's quite good. So I can now hold on to this. So because I've not got, to, you don't want to be pulling it around and making the creases. You want everything lovely and smooth, and these do just help give you that grip. So again, you don't have to go and spend expensive money if you've already got some in your stash, and because you're a quilter anyway, then great. Um, but if you're just a beginner and you're just having a go to see if you like it or not, then again, you don't have to go and buy anything expensive. You, it may be you've already got these already in your bathroom or in your cabinet or you've been gifted some in the past and not used them as yet just make sure everything feels nice and smooth underneath where you're going to be sewing next and just try and keep it as neat as possible so this is what it's looking like on the front now you really can't see much difference to be fair although if you do look or run your fingers across you can just start to see how this is just going to start and take the shape as it um, of the quilting though there's not in really enough on there yet to be able to make too much of a difference but what I'm going to do is take out the pins on the th top three pockets um, rows of pockets because we've now secured that fabric down as we can see from the back here one two three four rows of stitching there so we don't need these pins in anymore because they've done their job so we can take those ones out and it just means we've got less to manoeuvre around and get our threads caught up on. The next stage that we're going to do now is move towards the top of the panel and have a look and see what we're going to do there. So I'm just going to take these ones out, won't be a second. So I'm going to keep this row in here because they're going to be useful still. So if we look at this top panel here, we can see that each of these characters have been outlined in black and each of the snowmen as well. Let me just move you a bit closer. So each of these characters here have been outlined in black. And what we're going to do now is we're going to um, sew along those lines. Now, straight lines are fine sewing it by the machine. And also, you know, around the presents, you might find that you're happy to sew by machine. But the, the line is much thinner on these characters. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to hand quilt around them because I'm, I, like, I enjoy that process and I'm comfortable with it. If you prefer machine stitching, then just, you can sew on top of that line, just use your pivot, your needle down function and your pivot where you leave your needle in your work, but you lift your presser foot and then you can move your fabric round. And so you can carry on doing that if you want to. Um, I'm just going to do a little bit of hand stitching to show you. But what I will do in towards the end is, I mean, I'm, as we kind of, because I'm kind of working out, if you notice, we're starting the centre and we're working out. What I'm also going to do is I'm going to do a row of white stitches around here, which hopefully won't be too noticeable against the red and will be more forgiving. But that will just then secure the the um, backing around the edges as well. But what I want to do is I want to do a bit of quilting in the front here first and show you how to do that. So with the embellishing, we can use a whole manner of colours of um, embroidery floss and they often come on skeins like this. Um, these are some that were gifted to me by my friend Janet for my birthday a couple of years ago. So thank you, Janet, for those. And what they do is they've got um, six strands on them, generally speaking. And by pulling them gently, you can you can release off a length. I wouldn't suggest you do use more than your fingertip to your elbow because you're better to start and stop more regularly than you are to have a long piece. Because believe me, you think you're going to save time, but it gets knotted up so much that it's not worth it. And then we're going to separate these out. So let me just get my black because that's what I'm going to edge mine with. But you can use other colours as well if you wanted to, make yours a bit more colourful. So I've got this skein. So we tend to use the end where the number is. And if you can locate the end of your embroidery floss, says she when she can't find it. Where is it? Okay, folks, I've got no choice. We're going to have to just go with it raveling up. Just for demonstration, we'll see how it's just pulling through, but I couldn't find the end. So I'll tie this into a ball or round a little um, 
card holder, you get some thread holders that you can hold on to. So what we need to do now is we need to split it out. So if you just press the end, it tends to make it fan out. And then choosing one thread a strand at a time to separate it from the rest and just pull it out all the way along. And this is absolutely the best way of doing it because if you just hold them in your fingers and then just pull on your strand, it'll then pull through. So I'm gonna use two for doing this bit, next bit. So you want two lengths. And then I'm going to find the ends and put the ends together here. And then just smooth it down the length of, of the thread. Let me just get my needles. And I've got this John James Pebble in, in, in pink one. And I've just put the label on the back because it doesn't actually say anywhere else if you take the, the mount the box as to what they are. And I don't remember which colour is which. So these just open up like this. And then I'm just going to choose a needle. For sewing with it can be as big or as small as you want as you need and then what we're going to do is we are going to thread the end of the the two lines of the floss through the needle carefully this might be too thick for this one it is a different needle just too thin sometimes it is a little trial and error isn't it that might be better you can also buy threaders for these as well if you need to use one of those. Then we're going to do the same quilt as not as we've done before. I'm just going to just do two wraps round and then pull it pull it through, hold on to the needle. That's it, and then pull it through along to the end. Gives us a nice little neat little knot just there. Okay. So the way that we then work with this is we are going to find a line that we want to follow. So I'm going to outline this one here of the um snow one because you'll be able to see it nice and clearly. Ideally, you'd start with something in the middle, but I just want to start here because I want that to be nice and clear. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through from the back, somewhere near where I'm wanting to work, and I'm going to just push my needle through the back of my quilt, and I can feel, I've got my fingers on the inside, and I can feel that I'm not going all the way through, and then I'm just going to take a little stitch, and then pull my thread through until my knot is at the end. And then if you just give it a little bit of a tug, your knot should go inside your work, but not come out the other side. And then what we can do then is putting our needle back in the same hole, oh, and I'm pretty much on top, is we just find where we're going to come out. Now, okay, I'll come out halfway up. And I've, let's, let's put it in the right place, shall we? So working from the top, we can see where we're going to be. Let's move this down a bit. Should have paid attention to where I was going in, so I'm just gonna go down through my work a little bit just to hide that so you won't really see it and then going in just by there I want to come out right on the corner of this little snowman line just there like that I'm just going to turn my work sideways so I can see where I'm working towards if you've got a thimble now is the time to use that I'm trying to find mine so I have this thimble here, it's got like a latex rubber edge to it and then it's got the bucket end. So I use the bucket end for pushing the needle through. But this latex end is really good for gripping onto the needles if you're going through. And I wear it on my middle finger there. And then what we're going to do is do a little running stitch along this line. Literally just in and out, going through all three layers. But just keeping the needle on there. The silver bit that you see of your needle is the size of your stitch that will be seen on the top. Just pull that through so you've got no loops, a little loop on the end there, don't want that. And then we're just going to carry on doing this little running stitch. There is a proper way to rock your needle. I'm not experienced in that, but you could be able to find some, some tutorials of that on YouTube. I'm just going to do this little running stitch along this line here in black because I'm outlining now rather than embellishing. And as I say, if you wanted to, you could machine stitch this instead. But I, enjoy, I do enjoy the process of doing some hand sewing and especially this big stitch quilting, I do really enjoy. Gives it a little bit of a rustic look to it, but it's definitely a no doubt that it's been handmade and hand stitched. 
So you can see me just using my thimble. So can you start to see this now starting to take a bit of a, di a dimension and a bit of a shape? So what I'm going to do now is just follow this onto the scarf. Just following those outlines again. Make sure you don't pull your thread through your needle like I was just about to do. Sometimes it does hold on to it. And then I'm just going to change direction. And I'm just going to go along the scarf here. Come out at that edge there. And then I'm going to start and go along here. And then I'm going to follow the cattail down. So you kind of follow a line and then try and make it as continuous as you can. So bunch your quilt up in the other hand if you need to. So you can feel underneath with your finger to make sure you're going through all three levels. Be careful not to prick yourself. You don't want to get any blood on your quilt. If you do, apparently word on the street is that your own saliva is the best thing to get out blood. So um, your own blood. Apparently. Um, and then just do a few more stitches like this. So you've just got this like, little dotted line that's just embellishing it, but can you see how it's starting to give it a little bit of dimension? Hopefully you can see that on there. Let's go along by the cat tail. So again, I think that having hand stitching it does give you the ability to manoeuvre around your your project a little bit more easily. It's great for doing this when you're watching TV or if you're in a waiting room somewhere, if you can. You just pull out your stitching and just do a little bit. This project's maybe a little bit big for that, but if you're waiting in the car, say, kids are doing a football practice or you're having to pick somebody up from a train station, then you, this is the sort of thing that you can do. So have a look. let me know in the comments, do you prefer hand stitching it? Have you done these before? And do you think that machine stitching along these lines is better? Again, it might come down to a personal choice, but it's always interesting to know. And I, I, I'd love it if we became a bit of a community and give each other tips as to what you found work in the past and what and what, what does and doesn't work for you. And the needle's just come and threaded. So hopefully you can just start to see that's just starting to get that little bit of dimension now. And what we're going to do is we're going to turn this quilt from a flat piece of project, um, flat piece of fabric into a three dimensional project. There we go. Now I'm going to carry on working around this cat here. Oops, mine to the yellow of the bow. I want to finish on the black. There we go. And I'm just going to just go around the outside of this bow here. That's right, it's crossing over with the cat. Just do a stitch at a time if you need to, just if you've got any quite tight curves. And this is what I say, you can do as much or as little as you would like. I would suggest doing the snowmen if you wanted to. Um, you may choose not to do all of round the whiskers, well, I'd suggest doing the whiskers as well, but round everything, it's up to you. But I'd suggest round the snowmen and maybe along this um, border here where the um, horizon is, if you like, and around the tree. Um, but this is the bit that's gonna take the time, folks. So, you know, just take your time with this and get it how you like it um, and do as much or as little as you want. But as you can see, that's just starting to get that nice dimension there with that snowman now. It's coming almost 3D. And that will happen with all of the things that you outline. The more quilting you put on it, the stiffer your um, panel and your project will end up. That's the other thing that I found with quilting. And it's, it's really quite rewarding as it starts to take that substance in your hands. So that's what I'm going to be doing next. And um, let me do a little bit more and then I'll come back to you and show you how... Um, Oh, I'd better show you how we finish off a thread as well. So let me just do a little bit more. When I get to the end of the thread, I'll come back to you and show you how to finish off a thread. The other thing I want to show you is that if you want to travel, say like we're going along this scarf here, but say I want to just to change track and go across and do down this leg here, then what you do is you poke your needle through your top layer of fabric and into the batting. And if you have your finger on thumb on the top and your finger underneath, you can feel that you're not going underneath to the back 
and you just join up with where you want to go to. So we can see there's no, no thread visible on the top there. And if I go over to the back there, you can't see the needle. It's traveling between the three layers. So you just pull your needle out to there. Try not to pull it too tight because you, you don't need to pull it the thread tight as you're working to give you the quilted effect. Just the, the fact that you're cinching the, the three layers together will give you enough definition and then you can then start down your next little line that you want to want to embellish um, and just to quilt. As I say, it's just a little running stitch in and out. And load your needle up with three or four stitches. Make sure I'm in sight. Yes, I am. Okay, careful because you, you will prick your finger underneath. You can get little um, fabric dots, um, not no, fabric dots, leather dots that sit on your finger. And they, they are, a, I haven't got any of those, but those are a bit of a godsend. I've seen other people using those as well so that you don't keep, because you tend to sort of make sure that you've gone through your fabric with by touching your finger on the other side. So let's just go down this leg. Okay, and then I'm going to go across to the middle leg now. So again, to do that travelling, I'm going to put my fingers underneath, put my needle in, and then I'm just going to come out where the start of the line is. Okay, and I'm travelling between the two different layers, the three different layers. I should have enough thread to go up and do those legs, but I thought it would just show you a little nice little bit of definition and how these little drawn characters start to take on a little bit of their own definition and character of their own personality. And if this is a time as well for any little um, embellishments that you've had in the past, little sequins, um, little buttons, um, all those types of little things, that are different coloured threads, or if you know your different embroidery stitches, you can use a satin stitch, you could use French knots, you can use whatever you like to embellish your the top of your panel. And again, I'd sew the embellishments through all three layers. So we're going to the top here, and we're going to finish off, because I've only got a little bit of thread left, and there's uh, there's no point carrying on. So we're going to take our needle back in through our way. So we're just almost going to do a little stitch on top of where we were before. And then I'm going to put, pass my thread through all three layers and come out in the middle of my other piece of work. I take my needle off and then I'm going to tie a knot in my thread and use the back of the needle just to pull that through like that. And then if you use your needle and hold it down, you can put your needle through the loop of your knot and then as you pull tight, it cinches around the needle. And then what you can do is take the end off your thread Leave just a little tail. But then what you do is you take your needle, and you're going to do like a sweeping motion. So you're going to put your needle in, in through the, just the top layer of the panel. And then if you do a sweeping motion, you can see I've just caught that knot. You see it just pulling. And then you just push your needle against that knot, only that knot. And it should, she says, it should, if you get enough tension on it, maybe I'm not far enough away from it. You should then be able to then hear a pop as that goes through your work. There we go. It's just pulled through the work, can you see? So now we've finished off our first piece of thread and we can start to see that our characters are starting to take that three-dimensional edge. So we can see here we've got the one leg done but we've not got the leg. But look at the difference between the two. And again, just using that little running stitch all the way round, or if you wanted to, you can machine stitch on these. Or if that's too much faff for you and you're not somebody who wants to do that, you could always just do the horizon, do the pockets, and then do this white outside edge here and call it a day. So again, this is where I say it, it depends on how much detail you want to put into your panel as to what embellishment you're doing to it. So let me do a little bit more hand quilting and then I can come back to you and show you what I'm going to do in terms of the embellishment for the rest of it. So the other thing that I want to talk to you about is, is um, embellishing the um, panel because as, you, as you're going along, you're going to want to do that. I found some little black buttons and I'm going to sew those on each of the little buttons that would go on the front of a snowman. 
So that's going to, they're going to go and get sewn onto there. The other thing that I've got, sometimes you have things like this, so where you've had a dress or a garment that you've bought and you get some extra beads and glittery bits with it and what have you. So again, something like this can be used quite nicely on this kind of project, either to embellish a present um, or you can put it on the cat bow. You can give the cat a little name tag. Um, or you can use it on the Christmas tree if you wanted to. Again, we've got some other, other shapes here. You can put that on the end of the bow of his of his hat. Just fold this up a little bit for you so you can see. So again, on the end of his hat if you wanted to. And again, there's another one just there. Anything that's going to catch the light. Now, the only caveat I'm going to give you for this is that if your quilt is going to a very young child and they're not going to be supervised while they, they've got this quilt in their... Um, or advent calendar in their possession you might want to hold back on what you're actually using to embellish it things like the little seed beads and um, the buttons um, and these little crystals can all be choking risks so you need to be aware that you I mean a you've got to sew them on really securely anyway but anything like this you need to just be aware of so that you you're, you're taking the right amount of care the other thing I've got here is some, some nice sparkly buttons, little love hearts here that can be used. Um, sequins from other projects as well. These can be just taken off the, off the strings of the sequins and then they can be then sewn on. So like we've got the notes at the top here. A little note could have a little sequin put on at the, at the end of each little note just to catch the light. The, the options are endless and also... Um, I found somewhere a little little well, this one. So I've got a little like flower star here. If I can get into it. Goodness knows how long I've had these for absolutely ages, I think. Let me just get this through here. I don't think I can even remember what the dress was that it was on. But on on here there's a little star. Oops, goodness me, come on. A little star here, a little star sequin. So again, a decent one. That could be used perhaps on the Christmas tree. That could go on the top of the Christmas tree for a little star on top of the Christmas tree. Or it could be used on a present. Um, or it could be used, you can get snowflake buttons, can't you sometimes? I mean, you could sew a snowflake button down each of the side here into, um, oh, can't see. So we've got the snowflakes down, down on the side here. You snow a little snowflake button on top of each one of those as you're going down. So my suggestion would be to do your hand quilting first or your machine quilting to get your dimension. That'll start and give your project character. And then once you've done that, you can then raid whatever boxes you've got and see what you can find. As you can see, I've got a whole selection of things here, sequins and beads and what have you. But you've just got to be aware of, of the, the how you're sewing these on and also what they are then how safe they're going to be for your recipient because safety has to come first be before we look at how these projects look don't we? we need to keep our loved ones safe the other thing that i've got is a selection of old broken necklaces and that i save and again i save beads for those and they, they can be taken off and sewn on if you wanted to so again you can do as much or as little as you want, as you can tell. There's ju just a whole host of things, seed beads you can use if you want to. But again, you've got to be careful because of your recipient. The other thing that I do is I save ribbons. Let me just go and get some ribbons to show you. So if I'm fortunate to be gifted um, a present or um, chocolates or even sometimes, um, this was an old belt off a jumper that um, that I got I sent to the charity shop, but I thought, well, the ribbon will do come in handy. Then the other thing you can do is, is, is if you've got something like this one, again, it's just been a tag on a present. If you make it into, into a bow, let's do that and let's do it the other way instead. So again, this is double-sided, isn't it? So we need to just make sure that we've do it the other way around instead and then it'll be all better for me, I think. So again, if you get a little bow like this, a little piece of ribbon, there's nothing to stop you from popping it on top of the present. And then it actually gives you a little bit of embellishment or you can put on one of the cats. You know, you can you can just absolutely, your, your, you know, you can send your mind into a whole 
host of things searching through the house trying to find things again that would look nice with a little heart button wouldn't it a little heart button and especially if it matched the color of the of the cat already on there so a little button oops get my fingers right onto the center of that and then that could then go on to one of the cats um, over the top of there so again you can you can you can do whatever you want to do with these as much or as little set you know set your set your imagination off have some fun with it as well it's all supposed to be fun and i'm going to say i'm going to sew buttons on the on the top of the buttons here to give it some dimension a little heart possibly on the on the cat collar would be lovely a bit of ribbon christmas tree as well is going to be prime for having some um have prime for having some sequins sewn onto it again if i can find some of the right colors and again yeah just have fun so so that's what i'm off to do next folks i'm going to leave you with that now because that's the next stage that we've got done um and yes if you just just take your time embellish your project um, and then you'll be ready for the next stage so hopefully i've given you some inspiration as to how you can embellish your um, project and your advent calendar this is the most time consuming bit of pretty much the whole project really because there's so much choice you can either do as much as you as you want or as little as you want and i know i'm repeating myself but just to let you know there's no compulsion to have to do anything um you can just edge it round the edges if you wanted to just sew along that the um white just to hold it all together um but but have some fun with it if you've got a bit of extra time um it does look lovely when it's it, it starts to get that quilted feel and it does look nice um but again you can do as much as you want so have a little look around see what you've got in the bottom of the sewing drawer sewing cabinet that you've had for years because this is the perfect project to get the, all those buttons and sequins out and and just to embellish it if you if you, if you want to and if you think it's safe for your um the intended recipient of your um advent calendar to be able to have those um I'm going to leave you now with with that i know we haven't attached the pockets you might have thought that would be the next stage that we would do but i want those pockets to be anchored on really firmly so i want it to go through all three layers of the quilting which is why i've not attached them yet um, because i think when they're being pulled by little fingers or, or animals paws or whatever if they try to get in it when you're not looking um, then i want those to be nice and securely held on so that's why we're going through all three layers when we attach those but we'll do those in the next stage not this one so for now enjoy yourself quilting have a great day everybody i hope everything's all right with with you where you are in the world and i will see you next week when hopefully i've got a bit more done and we'll be able to um, spend some time attaching our pockets have a great day everybody and happy stitching bye